Hello and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams and I'm gonna get us started for today's session, American Rescue Plan Act funding, what to know. Before we begin, I'm gonna play our brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I would like to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams, Colleen Rosillis, partner, Haley Garcia, director, and Sheila Herrera, senior manager. Their bios and contact information are located in your webcast console if you would like more information. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Colleen to get the presentation started. Great, thanks Amy and welcome everyone. Today we're going to start by setting the stage a little bit, talking about budgeting for ARPA and looking it to your strategic plan. Um, while the funds have been out for a while and we've had guidance out for a while, most of our clients have not allocated the majority of their funds um, or they have a lot of questions about exactly what direction to go in and there's still been a lot of conversations and kind of in a wait and see mode. So we thought we would start out by setting the stage a little bit today. Um, and linking back to kind of overall processes. And really what I wanted to start out with was talking about your governing body and how to engage them in a positive way. There's a lot of interest in these funds. There's a lot of um, public scrutiny of what we're gonna do. Um, and there's a short period of time in terms of how we're gonna make these decisions. Um, there are so many reporting guidelines, um, different timelines, um, and expectations for getting these dollars out the door and what we're going to do with them. Um, and we want to make sure that we engage our councils and our boards in the right way. And that's kind of a perennial challenge um, for us in local government, um, getting folks in the right spot. You know, we've got those elected officials who are way up too high and they're not really engaged in the, in the right way. And then we've got folks who are way too in the weeds. Um, sort of the, you know, kind of, uh, worst case scenario. I, um, I had a board member once who, uh, would always request the AR aging report, um, and wanted to see all of that detail. And that's way too in the weeds, right? We want folks really engaged at that policy and strategy level. And that's particularly important when we're trying to make decisions about how to spend these one-time funds and how to spend them in a way that's most advantageous for our community and for our government. So what we really want to do is go back to our councils and to our boards and get them focused on outcomes. 
make sure that they remember in a policy governance model in that healthy way that they really need to focus on, okay, what is the ultimate goal of these dollars? Um, and some of the governments that we have been working with, when we're doing ARPA strategic planning, the focus a lot is on, okay, we have to think about quality of life for our community. Those are the conversations that we've been having kind of long term is, what are the ways that we can make the biggest impact and get the biggest thing for our buck with these funds? And that's what they always want to come back to. And so if we're able to bring them back to that outcome, then that can tie a lot of uh, a lot of these funds together in a very positive way. And then reminding them of that over time and really reminding them of that outcome can be very helpful. Um, I like to show this slide a lot uh, when I work with elected officials, just as a reminder of this is your role. This is the role of the city of county manager as we're moving forward so that they're not too in the weeds, not um, getting too much into that implementation uh, of the of the work and really focused on what are we trying to do and not necessarily the how. That can get a little bit more challenging and more complex with ARPA um, and with these dollars because there's so much interest by the community and by elected officials in these funds. Also because we need to collaborate with other governments. Um, if we can stretch the funds, um, if we can collaborate with our, our partners um, in uh, other cities, other counties, in kind of special purpose districts, or even with foundation funds or, uh, or others, as we'll see a little bit later in the presentation, that can be really valuable. And that might require using our elected officials in a different way than we may be used to. Um, we're also uh, having to be on our toes quite a bit with the changing requirements, the changing timelines, and the opportunities coming at us very quickly. And so making sure that we're on top of that um, and communicating that out appropriately while being transparent uh, with our elected officials. We also really have to be cognizant of the fact that these funds are one time or they're very short term and limited, but our community needs are not. Um, so for example, many of the communities that we work with are spending these dollars on homelessness. These are really limited term funds. We have a certain amount of time to spend them and yet homelessness is not a limited term situation. We're not gonna solve it in the three years that we have the funding available to us. And so really digging into those conversations is a very complex thing and the, and the ARPA dollars are not necessarily gonna be operational dollars that are gonna carry us past um, this timeline and address this need long term. Uh, ultimately, I guess what I'm saying is it's really difficult to keep our stakeholders educated here, right? That we have to, um, continue to communicate, communicate probably more and more than we ever thought that we did about this in order to make sure because this is just not a typical budgeting process. And on top of that, we're already in a revenue constrained local government environment where our operational capacity is already thin. So we're, we do not have the ongoing operations and maintenance funding and staff to be able to necessarily keep up with these potentially huge infrastructure investments that we could be funding with some of these dollars and that can be a challenge as well. So all of that is to say it's really challenging to set the stage and then move forward with planning for all of these dollars as we're moving forward, which I think is a huge piece of why so many governments have not allocated all of these dollars yet. So we recommend really kind of getting started with your strategic plan. If you don't have a strategic plan, develop an ARPA strategic plan. Um, and as a, uh, one of my team members likes to say, control the funds, don't let the funds control you. So really start the same way as you would with regular strategic planning. So you want to center back on your own vision and mission. And when we say that, it's thinking about as you would any program, service, or opportunity that comes your way. Um, and you're asking yourself, does this align with our vision? Um, is it going to help us to get closer to our vision? Is it in line with our mission and our values? And if it doesn't, should we really do it, right? Um, we want to take advantage of opportunities, but we also don't want to do things that are going to get us off course. And, uh, and those are really important questions to ask and great ways to engage your elected officials. This is going to keep you on track and it's going to keep you toward those outcomes that you have defined with your elected officials so far. And then as you establish those goals and objectives for these funds, they can all orient toward achieving your mission and achieving your long-term vision. When you're developing your ARPA strategic plan, make sure that you're considering all those key critical inputs. So 
taking a look at your financial forecast. I know over the last two and a half years, everyone has been forecasting and reforecasting, and you're probably really tired of it. I'm sorry to say that you're going to have to keep reforecasting um, and doing some scenario analysis of what this would look like with these different infrastructure investments, different community investments with these funds. Take a look at what the 10, 15 year impact of the investments would look like, what the operating implications would be, when we potentially would have to reinvest for um, maintenance of the assets, things like that. Um, and I think a good example is that many communities uh, initially were very interested in investing in additional um, parks equipment, playground equipment with some of the um, ARPA dollars. Um, we were talking about this about a year ago with quite a few of our clients. And then the, they kind of took a step back and said, well, we don't really have the staff or the dollars to keep up with our existing equipment. And so if we make big investments in new equipment, how are we going to continue to keep up? And so having those conversations is really important. Take a look at your own organization's risk profile and uh, address those areas that are highest risk. That's very important as you go through this process. And if there are ways that you can use these funds to mitigate your risk, that, that's a really great opportunity for these dollars. Really engaging your community members and your stakeholders, your community partners, that can be a way to help you prioritize as well as a way to potentially stretch your funds. Same thing with staff, helping to, to engage them in a way to, that helps prioritize the funds and also really listening to them about what they've been working on for the last two years, what's important to them and what their goals are for these dollars. Same thing with your leadership. Um, you've all been working really hard for the last two years on being very reactive and addressing crises in our communities over and over again. So this is an opportunity to take a step back and think long term, where do we want to go? How do we want to achieve our vision? And then really thinking about your programs and your operations. How do they fit in? How can we support this, this long term? Many governments have been plugging program and operational gaps with those flexible funds. Um, we need to be able to also think longer term once those dollars are not available, how sustainable is that and, and what can we do? And that's important to link back to your financial forecast, have those conversations with your elected officials and start setting the stage for that because the timeline will catch up with you sooner rather than later. Later. So where things might differ from your traditional strategic plan and where you might end up accelerating things that you may have uh, not planned to in your initial strategic plan is when you prioritize because of the hard funding deadlines that are, are related to some of these funds. So we recommend engaging your community members, your staff, your elected officials in prioritization exercises. Um, we actually just did a two-day prioritization with a leadership team a couple of weeks ago, just focused on the funds that they had available and all of the different potential projects that they had on their plate. Um, um, in order to really see how your priorities will stack up and what you need to focus on so that you can accelerate getting these funds out the door. Some things that might have been closer to the bottom of your list a couple of years ago may bubble up because of those funding opportunities. There are a couple of ways that we like to do that. You know, you can do just plain old sticky dots and, and voting by points. You can have people focus on trading off between different projects since you only have certain amounts of dollars, um, different goals um, that, you, uh, that you have certain, you know, kind of buckets that projects fit in. We also like to do a 248 consensus. If you have similar types of projects and you need to get to goals, you can have folks work together to get to consensus. My favorite type, particularly with elected officials, is to, to work on a budget allocation model. So it can be very hard with large amounts of dollars like this for folks to really wrap their minds around it. Um, sometimes we'll give folks a worksheet, but we'll only give them $1,000 to allocate between projects or priorities. And $1,000 is an amount of money that basically everybody can understand and it's easier to do the math uh, realistically. And so if we ask folks to spend $1,000 in between the projects and, and break that up, um, it can be very interesting to see how your stakeholders, your elected officials, or your, your staff or leadership actually do break out $1,000, say, between five to 10 priorities and see how that actually stacks up in between folks. It can be a really interesting exercise. So Amy, I think we've got a polling question. 
Yes, so our first polling question is, does your organization have a strategic plan? A, yes, uh, B, yes, but it needs updated, C, no, or D, I don't know. And to respond, uh, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And if you can't see the submit button, you will need to enlarge the slide area. And then also just a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. All right, it looks like most have responded, so here are the results. Oh, this is pretty good. So the vast majority of you have a strategic plan in place, and about a quarter have a plan that needs to be updated. So that's not a surprise. We're seeing a ton of local governments out there updating their strategic plans right now. And it's a great time to do it, especially because we have a lot of lessons learned from having, like I said earlier, responded to so many crises over the last couple of years. Taking advantage of those lessons learned and how much change we've been through, there has been a lot of turnover, um, especially at the management level. Um, taking advantage of new folks and getting those kind of fresh ideas and fresh leadership, it's a really good time to just take that step back and say, okay, how can we refresh our goals and how can we move forward here? So once we've got an ARPA strategic plan or just a general strategic plan that we have incorporated our ARPA goals into, um, we've got to actually put it into practice. And, uh, you know, the plan kind of builds the boat, right? But we've got to actually sail the boat. And so that's very important. Um, so there was uh, a study that was done by um, an, an organization called the New Localism that looked at a number of cities um, and, and came up with basically four different models. One was top down, so this idea of mayors or city managers just releasing proposals, um, having stakeholders involved to refine them, and then just having council approve them. Um, those were in cities like Detroit, Atlanta, um, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and New York. They allocated basically all their funding um, and mostly um, their flexible funding that they were receiving. Um, and in most of those cities, those were outgoing mayors that did that, um, probably because they wanted to make their mark on use of funds, but also they felt like they wanted to move very quickly. Um, in some of those cities, that was also because they needed that full allocation for budget remediation. Um, and so that made it pretty simple for them. Um, but most cities have really only allocated a portion of their funding, and they have been sitting back. And so the other three models are examples of that. So um, another example is that kind of ground up uh, process where they actually use participatory budgeting processes, it's community generated, and so um, this, what the city did was outlined priority areas, and then they, they had a process via their website where community organizations and city agencies could submit proposals for using funds in those priority areas, and then a cross-functional team of folks from across the city and community members scored the proposals, and that's how they got to the potential list of projects. Another is a collaboration with local philanthropy. So this is kind of interesting. The idea of seeking foundation and corporate matches for these federal funds so that we can stretch the money and that helped to free up more flexible funds. So the idea is we're increasing our impact across the community and we're also collaborating better with our stakeholders. We're having a, a better opportunity to invest in our infrastructure longer term and we can free up those flexible funds for those general operating dollars. So it's kind of a win-win-win across the board. That requires a lot of legwork on the part of staff and a lot of flexibility as well. Um, and then what we've seen, I would say, in most organizations is a very slow investigation of opportunities, really working with stakeholders to lead with that focus. So establishing advisory committees. Um, we've seen a lot of communities have advisory committees per priority area, um, gathering community input and really focusing on, okay, what, what does our community want as the core way to prioritize spending of these funds? And then also a focus of coordinating with other governments to be able to maximize investments. 
so this is how funds have been allocated so far. We've seen kind of the majority of funds going to government operations, closing those budget gaps. Um, this tracker is really interesting, and um, we've linked to this tracker in the slides if you download them after the presentation. This is a partnership between the Brookings Institution and the National League of Cities and the National Association of Counties, and they do keep it updated. As of a couple of weeks ago, um, the funds were basically 50% budgeted nationwide. So if you have not allocated all of your funds, um, you're probably uh, in the majority here. Um, we've seen uh, about $1.85 billion uh, allocated so far, uh, primarily government operations, and then basically evenly split between housing, community aid, public health, infrastructure, and economic development with a very small amount going to public safety. So when we think about budgeting, it really is just planning, right? We know that budgeting is um, is just one piece of the puzzle, but your budget is also a, a huge communications document, right? It's an annual way of communicating your priorities, communicating out to your residents, the community, and your stakeholders about what your priorities are. And it's also that opportunity for you to ask yourself some questions about, um, are we focusing on the things that we need to focus on? Um, so to going through this process, really reminding, um, as we are kind of wrapping up, I think that for most governments that uh, budget process, a couple of reminders. So we want to make sure folks really understand the ongoing costs of these investments, particularly for infrastructure, um, the investments that we are making, understanding that there are human costs, that we do have ongoing operations and maintenance where we can, focusing on flexible funds, and then thinking about how to handle the unexpected. So um, we've, we always have extra budgetary requests, right? Things always come along throughout the year. We've got, you know, council priorities or board priorities that come up. People have great ideas. We have grant opportunities that require matching funds. Revenue adjustments happen all year round. Um, on the plus side, uh, sometimes we've got salary savings and that can help us close some gaps. And then the big thing this year is inflation, right? The cost of doing business has increased like crazy and the cost of, um, salaries. Uh, we have lots of folks doing uh, uh, compensation and classification studies right now, and that's making a huge difference in terms of the cost of, of operations, um, and that's going to really impact us long term. And so how are we going to impact that um, and handle that moving forward? We recommend also really thinking about your budget in terms of an outcome-based model so that you can um, easily identify performance measures. You can easily communicate out to the community what your goals are and um, what that your budget is, your proposal to achieve those strategic results on an annual basis. That also gives you the opportunity to have those conversations instead of every year saying, what do we want to cut? You're saying, what do we want to keep? You can then identify every year having an operating plan Every department really tying to your budget, saying this is what we're going to accomplish. Um, there are a number of cities that have really great looking operating plans out there. This is an example from the city of Suwanee, Georgia. They've gotten a lot of awards for their budget. They've got objectives and performance me measures just built right into their budget of everything they're going to accomplish that year. Tying that to your um, one-time funds is a great opportunity. And then coming back out to the community, um, asking them what their priorities are and coming back out to them and saying what we accomplished is a best practice. This is from the city of Salem, Oregon. On an annual basis, they have a really great process where they survey the community. Um, then they produce an annual community report with those results that as well says, here's how we performed according to our strategic plan and our council goals. They come back to the council, report that to the council as part of their um, annual goal setting process. The council sets those goals in the winter. They build the budget based off of those goals. They, they work the whole year based on those goals. Then they go back out to the community uh, with the survey in the fall and they repeat the cycle all over again. This is a really good opportunity for them on an annual basis to survey the community and, and really get that pulse of what the community wants as well as to work to um, be able to be reflective and responsive. Um, and then they have the results year over year to see what the, what's important to the community and how that changes. And the council is able to be 
responsive in a statistically significant way um, because that's not necessarily who always shows up to those council meetings. So Amy, we've got another polling question. All right, thank you. So our second polling question is about what percentage of your ARPA funds have you allocated or budgeted? And your options go from A, none, all the way down through 100% uh, or not applicable. And while you're responding, um, I would like to take this time to remind you, uh, you can submit questions for the presenters using the Q&A window. We do have quite a bit of content to cover today, so if we don't have time to get to yours, we will uh, do our best to follow up with you afterwards. We'll leave this up another five seconds or so. Okay, here are the results. Okay, so we have a wide spread of results. We have just a few folks who answered 100%, but we've got, I think, folks right at kind of 50 to 75%, maybe the majority. So that's kind of right on track with what we're seeing nationwide. Um, okay, Haley, over to you. Okay. So I'm Haley Garcia, um, and I'll be presenting this next section on internal controls and compliance. And so as recipients of these relief funds, uh, you are responsible for ensuring that adequate internal controls are in place uh, to ensure that these funds are properly safeguarded, they're used for appropriate means on allowable costs, and that you're operating in a compliant way. Um, of course, you want to make sure that you're using these funds to the benefit of the community or for their intended pur purpose, but hopefully doing it in a safely and compliant way. And so today I'm going to go uh, quickly through a few slides to cover those kind of keys to success to be able to promote uh, compliance within your organization and set yourself up for success internally. Uh, throughout the period of availability for these funds and as they're being budgeted for and spent and reporting back on their usage, but also to set you up for success going forward when you think of upcoming uh, single audits on the compliance side or uh, other um, opportunities where fund the funders may come in and uh, perform compliance audits. Um, some key considerations uh, to be thinking of is to make sure that you've defined internally and documented what the internal controls are in place for monitoring these funds. So within your organization, if you've been receiving a large volume of federal funds in the past, uh, this might be nothing new, but the types of allowable costs, the types of programs being funded may be new. But really look at those, the internal control environment overall to say, what are our controls for making sure that we're monitoring the use of these funds on an ongoing basis? Uh, one of the key things here is defining roles and responsibilities. So what we see with most of uh, cities and counties and other organizations that we work with is that grant management or compliance overall is handled in a decentralized way. And so there's various departments or divisions across a city, for instance, different programs being ran and funded, different uh, construction or infrastructure programs that are going on that are being led by different groups. But in general, it's typically done in a decentralized way. So there's many individuals with responsibilities for the accountability aspect of these funds throughout the few year period. And so really defining what does that look like uh, throughout your organization and who is responsible for each component of compliance. So whether it's um, uh, ensuring that uh, expenditures are tracking the budget or making sure expenditures are allowed and properly supported, who's responsible for meeting the reporting requirements, tracking deadlines and due dates, Who's responsible for record keeping, evaluating the eligibility of the projects that we're going to be funding? Um, so documenting that, uh, those roles and responsibilities on the front end to be able to make sure that we have an accountability structure going forward. Next is providing training on the key compliance requirements to all affected employees. Again, um, given the nature of how most of these funds are being spent, um, 
really looking at who should go through training on what are your general responsibilities and what types of things do you need to know in managing the various aspects um, of the funding. Um, ensure documentation is adequate to support the use of funds. Of course, anytime you're using grant funds or, or any funds really, but specifically in the case of federal funds, making sure that you have a defined process uh, for making sure that all expenditures being um, allocated or um, expense to these funds are properly supported, that we can show how we purchased it, how we approved it, how we were invoiced for it, how we documented that it was allowable and approved. And document uh, the justification for decision, decisions made on spending. Um, given that uh, this is kind of uh, new territory in some ways, I know a lot of you probably um, had gone through uh, coronavirus relief funding in the past. Um, there are changes to what's allowed and what programs and projects are going to be eligible. So the Treasury did provide a framework in the final rule for evaluating whether projects are eligible and whether they respond to a public health emergency or a negative economic impact. Um, here, typically, we just recommend that people are documenting the justification for decisions made, whether it's in the budgeting or the spending process. Um, and how you're categorizing expenditures or projects, why you believe that something's eligible, making sure you're documenting the justification to support that. Uh, the compliance and reporting guidance came out. The Treasury uh, updated this in February of 2022. It's called uh, Compliance and Reporting Guidance for State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds. Um, these should be used in conjunction with your uh, award terms and conditions, the authorizing statute and the final rule, and other requirements that are out there. We have included uh, the link here. Definitely something that's good to, to look at, make sure that you understand. There's nothing um, completely new in there, I would say, as far as from a compliance uh, requirements perspective. But it does really break it down into terms that are easier to understand than uh, the very long final rule and definitely talks about what your requirements are, which we're going to go through here in just a minute. Um, and in general, uh, state and local fiscal recovery funds are subject to the requirements under the uniform guidance with some nuances um, that I want to call out today. Um, but however, recipients do have to consider whether and, and how certain uh, requirements apply. Uh, so the one in red here that I wanted to point out is that cash management is not applicable here. So typically with federal funds, uh, federal funds are either not allowed to be put in interest-bearing accounts where you're going to benefit from the interest earned. And if you do, um, it typically has to be remitted to uh, the funder or has to be very specifically tracked, reported, and put back into this, the program purpose. Um, recipients are, are allowed to place these funds in interest-bearing accounts, so making sure that you're considering that, evaluating how these funds are going to be held, how they're going to be segregated throughout the um, period of availability. You do not have to remit interest earned to Treasury and they're not limited in their eligible uses. So this is pretty rare for federal funding and something to consider. Uh, when we look at the other ones here, um, some of the things I wanted to point out is, is just looking at the allowable activities, um, making sure that you're required, uh, that you're having internal controls in place supporting those funding decisions that are made and making sure that you're documenting that. On the allowable cost side, um, it's based on the premise that a recipient is responsible for that effective administration of federal funds in a way that is going to be consistent with those program uh, and uh, purpose objectives and the terms and conditions that are laid out. Uh, the key is to build that trust and accountability throughout the organization. Um, and making sure that you're evaluating all those costs that are coming in and all of those expenditures that are being recorded. Um, administrative funds, including both direct and indirect administrative funds, 
consulting fees, compliance support, those sort of things are considered an allowable cost, but making sure that you're identifying those um, and allocating them appropriately. Um, I think I'll skip to the next slide for the sake of time. So the period of performance uh, for these, which I, I'm sure you're aware and Sheila will touch on a few things later, um, this is uh, the funds can be used to cover eligible costs incurred between March 3rd of 2021 and uh, December 31st of 2024. They do have to all be uh, fully spent by December 31st of 2026. And there are some exceptions uh, for costs that were incurred prior to the beginning date. But in most cases, uh, that situation has probably already been dealt with. Next thing I want to spend time on is subrecipient monitoring considerations. And so really thinking about as an organization, are you going to be re-granting out uh, funds to subrecipients specifically? So uh, we'll hit on later uh, beneficiaries and how that will apply. But when we look at subrecipients and are we giving out subawards to carry out uh, certain pieces of programmatic or purposes of the award, um, looking at what we do internally. So has your organization, have you done subrecipient monitoring in the past? How do you regranted funds? And really looking at what is our baseline? Do we have documented policies and procedures which are required uh, for this funding uh, that says how we're going to monitor subrecipients, which we'll talk about? Uh, developing templates for whether it's our subrecipient agreements, whether it's our budget templates for subrecipients, whether it's our preliminary risk assessments, developing templates so that we're having a consistent process that's well controlled throughout um, the period. And records management practices. You are responsible as the recipient of the funds for getting the required um, support to show that you did your due diligence and monitoring the use of the funds by subrecipients. So making sure that you have good records management practices. On the pre-award side, so we're talking pre-award for giving out sub-grants or sub-awards to subrecipients. Uh, there are certain specific disclosures that you have to make, um, including that the funds are an award of this specific, uh, an sub award of this specific award. Um, also that any and all compliance requirements um, are applicable to the use of those funds and that these subs are going to be responsible for reporting requirements uh, back to you, back to you to be able to report subsequently um, uh, as you're required to for this funding. Um, SAM.gov registration for subrecipients, you do need to have a process in place for checking that, making sure you're documenting that check. Um, having documented eligibility criteria, again, this goes down to your policies and procedures around evaluating eligible uses, and that um, also applies to when you're regranting funds. And having a documented evaluation and award process on how you're scoring, how you're deciding who's going to get awards and how those awards are going to be made. Post-award requirements, similar to other funding, um, you do have to have a reporting process back on the spending of funds um, and a review process where you can't just be getting back those uh, subrecipient reports and not doing anything with them. You do have to have a review process in place. And they do allow for risk-based monitoring. So if you've done that pre-award risk assessment, utilizing those results to determine the level of subrecipient monitoring that's going to be required. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, the compliance and reporting guidance does um, provide internal control best practices. And in some of these areas, there's very specific requirements that you have to have certain things documented. And so I've provided a high level summary here in some examples, but the important thing to really uh, evaluate is, um, do you have uh, citywide, countywide, entity-wide um, policies and procedures in place over very key functions that impact um, overall, but also uh, impact these relief funding um, specifically? And so looking at, are your procurement policies documented? Are they updated in compliance with the uniform guidance? 
uh, looking at things like record retention and grant management overall, making sure that you have documented current comprehensive policies in these areas um, entity-wide. But then when we also look at specific to these recovery funds, um, looking at the things that specifically need to be called out. So eligibility determination, risk-based monitoring, how are we going to do that? Our subrecipient monitoring, how are we going to do that? How are we going to determine the eligibility of beneficiary? Some of these things are specific things that they call out that you need to make sure you have. Written standards of conduct, looking and making sure that you do have the code of conduct and ethics and conflict of interest policies that they're current, that they're in place, that we're actually um, uh, complying with them because that is required. Risk-based due diligence, uh, this incorporates the pre-award risk assessment process and how we're monitoring subrecipients as well as how we're uh, looking at what are our eligibility requirements and how much support do we need to be giving. Next, whoops. Next slide here, risk-based compliance monitoring. This would apply both to internal within your organization. How are you going to be checking for compliance, especially if you have a decentralized uh, manner of managing grants or specifically these funds? Um, as well as record maintenance and retention. How are you saving support to support allowable costs? How are you saving subrecipient reporting and payment information? And how are we supporting procurement and disbursement uh, decisions and supporting documentation? And then the last slide here, uh, given time crunches today, we won't go into the details on the reporting requirements. I do know there are some really great webinars out there issued by Treasury uh, that goes through in detail how to complete these. However, they can definitely still be um, confusing at times. One of the important, most important things that we recommend to the, um, the entities that we work with is really having a defined tracker, given that there are quarterly reporting due, uh, there are varying due dates depending on the type of report, annual reports due, making sure that you have a method for tracking. What are the reports due? What are the frequency? What are the due dates? The coverage periods? Um, and that we have assigned accountability for pulling all that information together for reports and approving and documenting uh, that these reports were approved prior to uh, the submission date. Uh, we're also looking at what is the reporting content that is going to be required for those reports that are coming due and making sure that we know now how are we going to collect and accumulate that information that we have to um, report on, whether it is expenditure data coming out consistently out of um, our general ledger, how are we going to track that, or whether it is more on the program and performance side. We are required to make sure that we have um, documented methodologies for how we're going to report on performance statistics or how we're going to gauge how much progress has been made. So setting yourself up for success on the front end to make sure that those reports are properly supported, that we can justify what we're reporting back at these required periods, and that we have a system of accountability for the reports that are being submitted. I'm going to pass it over to Sheila now. Thank you, Haley. As you can imagine, with all of the COVID funding, the federal government has been getting a lot of questions related to the roles and the uses of funds. In this section, we'll go through some of the Treasury's final rule updates that, that Haley um, pointed out that may impact you and how you document or include in your plan as you move forward here. And so the first update here is updates to the lost revenues. You are now allowed to elect the one-time standard allowance for revenue loss of up to $10 million, not to exceed the award allocation, of course, or you can use the Treasury's revenue loss calculation. Electing to accept the standard allowance of that $10 million will not increase or decrease the recipient's total allocation. If you choose to go down the road, of the revenue loss calculation. Um, there were also updates to the Treasury's um, re revenue loss calculation where the growth factor did increase from the 4.1% to the 5.2%. The calculation um, date can either be your first fiscal year end or calendar year end. And there was clarity made that 
the revenue loss amount is not eligible use and does not go on the SEPA. And so there's been some confusion or questions about what that might look like. Amy, we have a polling question. All right, so our third polling question, has your government performed an updated revenue loss calculation incorporating the changes in Treasury's final rule? A, yes. B, no, we have performed the revenue loss calculation but have not updated, updated it with the changes in Treasury's final rule. Or C, no, we haven't performed the revenue loss calculation yet. And then also, uh, once you've completed all of your CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your certificate um, from the CPE progress window in your console. All right, here are the results. Thank you, Amy. Well, it looks like at least most or half of you um, haven't kind of gone through that revenue loss calculation, and so maybe you have some options to go to that 10 million option. Um, we've had a lot of questions from our clients in relation to this calculation, so if you aren't sure about it, you know, reach out to your CPA kind of get an idea of what you need or to make sure you know you're following kind of the rules and the requirements of what this might look like. The second section here updates um, the general revenues. Um, these can now include utilities and liquor store revenues. Under the final rule, recipients must adjust actual revenue totals for the effect of tax cuts and tax increases that are adopted after this January 6, 2022 timeline. And then recipients should still include gross revenues from enterprises or component units that you may have. So just think of your revenues in a holistic way and making sure that you have the right numbers as, as you look at your general revenues. Um, government services generally include any service traditionally provided by the government. As you know, many governments could be providing a number of services and it's important to understand each of those revenue streams and what gets allocated or processed in those revenue streams. Um, you can still include things like capital projects, economic development, and other general fund type programs and services. It's also the only eligible use category that can be used for matching or cost sharing. And so there were also changes to help, you know, stream like project and expenditure reporting um, that Haley mentioned. So thinking through, you know, what this could look like and how you report it back to um, the feds. So updates on payroll. Um, governments can use the funding to increase its number of employees up to 7.5% above its pre-pandemic staffing levels. Funds can be used for funding for employees who had pay reductions or furloughs um, to maintain current compensation levels to avoid layoffs um, and to provide worker retention incentives to employees. Less than 25% of that base pay or 10% of the group or category of employee pay. And so worker retention incentives have become strategically more important as many employees have shifted jobs in the last few months or are planning to shift jobs due to newfound opportunities. And so we are seeing more discussions um, in the government setting around these types of incentives um, and what they can actually do with this money. Premium pay um, is optional additional compensation funded by federal money provided to state and local governments under ARPA for eligible workers performing essential work during the COVID-19 public health emergency. There was clarification provided that the premium pay may provide pay retrospectively for work performed, and there were no changes to the eligible use criteria. So they at least made that clear in that final update. Updates on capital expenditures. Um, unfortunately, this became more restrictive in this final rule. Um, capital expenditures must be related to and in and to and incurred in a reasonably proportional response to the harm from or impact of the pandemic. They have also clarified that some of the allowable uses of funds, um, so there could be cases where not all capital expenditures that have been planned in the response to the pandemic may be considered allowable. And so we'll go through a couple of those here. 
um, construction of a new facility for the purpose of mitigating spread of COVID would not be considered a reasonable proportional response and generally would not be considered an eligible use. Um, other improvements could be made more quickly and are typically more cost effective than constructing a new facility. And so those are things that as you go through your strategic plan or your documentation, you will want to have that all kind of documented to make sure that you are meeting that um, specific use that is allowable. Um, allowable capital projects may include testing and lab equipment, emergency operations centers and equipment, affordable housing, child care facilities, schools, primary care, health clinics, and hospitals, job and workforce training centers. There are also clear, is also clarity that the government, you know, is not required to prepare um, written justification for projects. There was some questions about what local governments really had to document. But you should still maintain documentation indicating the project was in response to the pandemic. You will want to make sure you doc your documentation is clear about that allowable use of your capital project expenditure. And so if you have um, a construction project that was originally budgeted to be used with unrestricted general fund resources of the government, but then you find out later it could be covered with this fiscal recovery fund money as a government service, you will really need to go through and consider whether you can use um, those costs for these federal funds. And so as you go through the process, really think about, you know, did you go through that competitive bidding requirements? Are all those procurement transactions for property or services required under that federal award? Um, you have to follow certain, you know, certain procurement requirements and you have to have that all documented. And so did you do that before you allocated it over to the federal funds? Or are you kind of backtracking and you really are thinking through this now? And so thinking through um, what that documentation looks like, what has already been done in the process, can you really use those dollars for this uh, fiscal recovery fund um, grant money? And so sole sourcing tends to be the exception, of course, but there still needs to be documentation in the file related to that sole source and how it's accounted for. Um, going through Davis-Bacon, um, that was scoped out related to these funds. However, if you have construction projects where you're using these funds with other federal dollars um, that you might be splitting a project on, um, you have to then go back to the Davis-Bacon rules for expenditures, anything in excess of that $2,000, you must then follow um, that Davis-Bacon requirement. Um, and so that Davis-Bacon um, requirement may not apply um, to capital projects fully funded by the state and local fiscal recovery fund. Um, the report, however, you still have to report information here. And so that includes the number of employees of contractors and subcontractors working on the project, the number of employees on the project hired directly and, and hired through a third party if you're using a third party. Um, and then the wages and benefits of workers on the project by classification and whether those wages are at rates less than those um, that are prevailing. So a lot of information there. So if you do fall into this category and you do need to have that reporting done, just make sure you understand what those reporting requirements are. Um, Haley mentioned um, some of these high-level things, you know, as your policies and procedures. So I'm not going to go through these in detail here. Um, but I do want you to keep these in the forefront as you start to add that documentation to your file and what you really should have there um, as far as you know, maintaining records, what conflict of interest is, things like suspension and debarment going back to that procurement requirement. So implementation of the final rule, um, again, Haley mentioned, this is something that needs to be obligated and expended by a certain period of time. And so if you have funds that were obligated and expended between this March 3rd to 21 to 22 period, you can use either that interim rule or final rule. If you have funds that are obligated and expended starting April 1st, um, you must then follow that final rule. Um, and then thinking through the double dipping risk, um, we've had a lot of questions from governmental entities related to which funds they're able to use for certain dollars. And so you can't get paid for the same dollars using different buckets of federal funds. 
And so just making sure that you all have documentation on your side that makes that clear that you really don't have an issue with that. Going to the next slide here, Haley touched a little bit on subrecipients. Um, we also have what we call a beneficiary. And so beneficiaries are not subject to single audit requirements under the uniform guidance. And so we do have some tables here about what is a subrecipient versus a beneficiary. Um, the distinction between the two is contingent upon the rationale for why a recipient is providing funds to the individual or the entities. And so you could have dollars here that might fall into one category, and then you could have dollars that would fall into another. And so really understanding what that looks like and having that documentation to support that, because again, those beneficiary dollars do not go onto your CEPA. Um, best practices here is making sure that you document, document, document. As you have heard this already, um, it's so important. The AICPA did a campaign a few years ago that basically said if it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. So you want to make sure all your calculations, you know, including any key calculations that are being done are being documented, which rules you're following. You want to go back to those controls that you might have implemented and revisit those and revisit your policies and procedures. It's important to understand that there may need to be changes to both your controls and your policies and procedures as you start to move through both your strategic plan and what that might look like for how those dollars are spent. And you might want to update that as you go here. Um, you want to kind of review the U.S. Treasury website, making sure that you, know, you understand any FAQs that are out there, any terms and conditions of the money that you're receiving um, in relation to the grant funding. And then also important to understand what does and what does not go in the CEPA. And so um, sometimes it's, you always want to think of um, you know, some of these dollars as everything goes on the CEPA, but sometimes it might not. And so just really thinking through that. And you might have questions for your CPA as you start to build your, your CEPA for your 630 year end or 1230, or whatever that looks like for you. So Amy, last polling question here. All right, thank you. So our last polling question is, what is your biggest compliance concern with using coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds? Uh, A, spending the funds on unallowable activities. B, construction-related compliance concerns. Uh, C, reporting. D, subrecipient monitoring. E, the provisions of uniform guidance. Or F, not concerned at all. And we'll try and go pretty quickly on this one since we're almost out of time. All right, here are the results. Perfect, thanks, Amy. And so it does look like we're kind of making sure, you know, that we do have allowable activities in the forefront, allowable uses of funds, and then reporting. Um, subrecipient monitoring is also a big one here, and so really understanding what your subrecipients are spending that money on is important. Um, so just thinking through all that as you're getting to the end of the year here um, is very important, obviously. And if you do have questions, obviously check with your CPA. You know, they can help guide through some of these. Finally, we do have some other information here with some links. Um, so be on the lookout for, again, for any FAQs. Um, the CFDA, hopefully the compliance supplement, we will see any day now, um, along with some compliance and updated reporting guidance that Treasury has issued. And as Amy mentioned, I think we're out of time here for questions, but anything kind of left in the queue, we will follow up with you. Yes, thank you. So unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, but thank you, Colleen, um, Haley, and Sheila for a great presentation today. And we did have quite a few questions. If you have additional ones, uh, go ahead and send those over to the presenters. Their contact information is located in your console. And then also, um, if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE uh, progress window. We will email a copy within three weeks should you have difficulty downloading it now.
And then also, here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. And thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time.